very much. Um, my final speaker, before we have a little Q&A, before we close the day, um, is probably, well, first of all, we should be very grateful that he's here with us this morning because he has a ticket for the Beyonce concert. <laughs> and if he had his way, he'd be home, ironing his shirt and sprucing himself up. So, yeah, particular gratitude today. But no, my final speaker is perhaps as responsible as anybody for the success of the London Schools and the Black Child Initiative. Because as well as being a key supportive initiative, he's, he worked with GLA in the period when Ken Livingstone was funding it. And he knows the ups and downs, um, the behind the scenes stories. There was the year that when we bought all these patties for people to have for their lunch, but the people at Queen Elizabeth II didn't manage to have to defrost patties. So you think you people were moaning about having to pay a pound? You should have heard them when they opened these bags with the frozen patties. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that. It's David I had to run. Um, but David Wood, um, he's committed to his community. He's a tremendous organizer, administrator. He also, part of his role in relation to London School's Black Child, would you believe it, he had to liaise and negotiate as between Lee Jasper and myself. He has the patience of the same, right? Mm. Um, so David has been one of the pillars of the initiative and is going to work with us in the future, going further and higher, I give you David Wood. Thank you. The um, problem is, Dan, as ever, has stolen a lot of my best lines, so I'm just sort of going to have to work through this. Um, afternoon conference. Um, I'd like to begin by saying, obviously, what an honour it is to have been asked by Dan to address you today. Um, my name is David Wood, I'm standing before you in my capacity as a school governor, a soon-to-be trustee of the London School of the Black Child Charity, and uh, a parent of two young children, and I hope an educationally informed uh, parent of two young children. Um, as Diane's mentioned, the conference is an event that I hold particularly close to my heart, and it's how I've got to know Diane. Um, as Diane mentioned, in previous existence I used to work for Ken Livingston, and uh, a man whose commitment to this conference was, was total. And, and in that role, I used to work closely with Diane in organizing these events. And I have to admit that having worked with Diane for a number of years, I was really amused by the, um, some of you might remember the row of the Ferrari last year when Diane rightly pointed out that some people in positions of power like to use divide and rule tactics when it comes to their interactions with black people. Um, because, you see, in our planning meetings for these conferences, there will be three of us. There would be Diane, there would be Ken Senior Advisor, Merzlin Parchment, who is another formidable Jamaican woman, and there would be myself, uh, a man. <laughs> and <laughs> not only that, but a man of Barbadian parents. <laughs> so, a Barbadian of, of, a born between two Jamaican roses. <laughs> doesn't know how to practice divide and rule tactics. <laughs> it's not in those meetings. Because I was never in any doubt who the rulers were and where the divide was. Um, so anyway, I have to say though, I'm very pleased that Dan has arranged to have some Beijing and Shirley biscuits out, outside there. So, uh, you know, big up for that. I wasn't expecting that. So I'm in the right place. Um, so here I am. I've um, come full circle really. I've been inspired by this conference to get involved, to be part of the change that I want to see in education in this country. Um, so for me, standing on this platform, following Diane and the fantastic speakers that we've had is a huge and very humbling thing for me because it used to be me sort of running around trying to find PowerPoint presentations for speakers, you know, at the other conferences. So, And the problem though, going last, is that you know, the panel, the panel that we've got and the panels we've seen this morning, they take all your best lines. So now you're just left with what's left, I'm afraid, but I'll work through it. Um, the question before us was whether our young black people, young black people are being priced out to further and higher education and how they can access the top institutions. Now, Aaron has you know, expertly pointed out the answer to that first question is undoubtedly yes. You know. um, and that's, that ground has been covered, so I'll sort of skip over that a little bit and keep my remarks relatively short. But what I would say is that we're living in distinctly unnerving times, as we've heard. You know, we have a government that, under the cloak of austerity, 
misleading close posterity, I should say, has embarked on some of the most pernicious attacks on some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And so at the sharp end, as ever, those people who can least afford to bear the pain, you know, as we've heard. And so, you know, heard about the, the, the housing benefit cuts of disability <laughs> living allowance, um, education maintenance allowance, again, which we've heard about, which for many uh, of, our, of our people is the difference between staying in education and being forced to drop out altogether. Um, it's been cut by 60% for further education college students, I think that's right. And, you know, we had, and for higher education university students, you know, cuts, uh, tuition fees of £9,000 per year. Because what's clear is our society has become increasingly polarised between the haves and have nots to such a degree that the young people at the lower end of the socio-economic scale have no choice a lot of the time but to drop out of full-time education. They don't want to, they have no option. You know, it's compounded by the fact that many of the part-time jobs that would otherwise be needed to supplement those student incomes don't exist anymore. Mm. They've been taken by in a job market that's flooded with other victims of the cuts agenda, if you like. And our big BME communities overrepresented at the lower end of the economic, socio-economic scale. Well, we know they are. Or to, to quote the better vice president the US never had, you betcha. So the second part of the question for us in this session is in terms of access to the top institutions. I mean, considering what I was going to say today, I spoke to my big sister to get some ideas as to what she thought, how I could put across what I wanted to say. Um, because as, as ever, the answer to these questions seem to me to be multifaceted. And so I wanted to look at what can we do, firstly, and then what can the institutions do to help our young people get into those top institutions. And my sister drew my attention to a book she was reading called There Are No Shortcuts by an inspirational American teacher called Rafe Esquith. And Rafe has been teaching in Los Angeles, and his students are all from a community of poor immigrant families. But his fifth grade students consistently score in the top 5 to 10 percent of the country in standardized tests. Now, many of his students, they volunt voluntarily start class at 6.30 each morning, and two, hour two hours before the rest of the school students, that is, and many stay as late as 6 p.m., often working through those, their recess periods. Not because they have to, but because they choose to. And they do so because Esquith drums the following poem into them, and it's just called Pretty Good. This is, I'll just read it briefly. Pretty Good. There was once a pretty good student who sat in a pretty good class, who was taught by a pretty good teacher who always let pretty good pass. He wasn't terrific at reading, he wasn't a whiz bad at math, but for him education was leading straight down the pretty good path. He didn't find school too exciting, but he wanted to do pretty well. But he did have some trouble with writing, and no one had taught him to spell. When doing arithmetic problems, pretty good was regarded as fine. Five plus five needn't always add up to be ten. A pretty good answer was nine. The pretty good class that he sat in was part of a pretty good school, and the student was not the exception. On the contrary, he was the rule. The pretty good student, in fact, was part of a pretty good mob, and the first time he knew what he was lacking was when he looked for a pretty good job. It was then, when he sought a position, he discovered that life could be tough, and he soon had a sneaking suspicion Pretty good might not be good enough. Mm -hmm. The pretty good town in our story was part of a pretty good state, which had pretty good aspirations and prayed for a pretty good fate. But there was once a pretty good nation, pretty proud of the greatness it had, which learned much too late, if you want to be, get, to be great, pretty good is in fact pretty bad. You see, the brutal truth of the answer to the question is that pretty much the only way of accessing a lot of these institutions is if you, if you are not born into privilege and the right networks is the hard way. That is, for our young people to work as hard as they can, to commit themselves to being single-minded in their determination to succeed, to avoid dis distractions, and to seek to be the kind of student that is attractive to the best. That means having what's called the cultural capital and the confidence to present themselves in the right way, to be polite, to be on time, to be presentable, and to speak in a way that holds no fear for those who take the decisions as to whether they accept you or not. Because the sad truth is paper, paper qualifications only take us so far. The reality is that admissions authorities will always look for more than that. The, the code, you know, sign for fit, you know, do, you, do we think you fit into our institution, that kind of thing. Now, some of these are obvious, and I've outlined some of them above, but others are less clearly defined. And so either way, the rules of the game don't change that much. It's just that it's a game that we are not so used to playing. So it's our job as parents and carers to help our young people navigate their way around this process so they have the skills and understanding they need. But it's clear, I'll be clear, it's not to say that they need to be able to speak the Queen's English at all times. And there's merit in the argument that it's good for our young people to stay rooted, you know, in touch with their friends and families. We don't necessarily always speak that way. But what is important is that our young people have the tools to be able to switch 
to feel comfortable that when they find themselves in situations that demand that kind of response, okay. to, sorry, to, sorry, the situations that demand that kind of response, see, I get a huge sense of satisfaction when my five-year-old corrects my two-year-old and says, it's not biscuit, it's biscuit. <laughs> not because I want him to be bossy, but because I know that he'll be judged on such things in his life, and it's far better that he gets into good habits now. Because though we, me, we may at times wish him to, the rules of engagement in this country are just not going to change any time soon. Those are rules, and we need to become adept to playing them. So I'm not saying that we all have to be race desperate, but he should be an inspiration, because pretty good should be our biggest fear, because it will never be enough for our children to get to where they belong. Because too, because too often we, we find ourselves saying, oh, he's doing all right, or the school or college isn't bad, but that isn't good enough. Because in seeking to raise the aspirations of our children, we need to raise them for ourselves also. So to briefly, and to briefly go back to, we started, to where we started, too many of our young students are forced to study at underperforming educational uh, institutions simply because they're closest to home and therefore the cheapest. So that is some of what we can do, but we can do more. The key that we, the key is that we need to plan if we want our children to get into these top institutions. So that means even before they take their GCSEs or EVACs or whatever they may in the future, plotting a path to their degree to give them the best chance of success in these places. Because BME applicant success rate at Oxford and Cambridge and the other top institutions is seriously affected by subject choice. So recent analysis has shown that Oxford's three most oversubscribed large courses that's large meaning 70 places or more, are in economics and management, medicine and mathematics. And these accounted for 43% of all BME applicants <coughs> compared to 17% of all white applicants. So in 2009, 28.8% of all black applicants um, applied for medicine compared to 7% of white applicants. So we need to research and to plot the route to the best opportunity. Something else we can do, and this is something the institution should be doing also, is knowing where the schemes are that help BME students into top universities. Because did you know that the Russell Group, that we've heard about before, of the 20 top universities in England, they set aside over £100 million for bursaries, scholarships, fee waivers, aimed at improving the access of underrepresented and disadvantaged students. By 2016-17, this will be over £200 million, including outreach work. So it's out there. But who knows about it? Because too often the schools and colleges aren't up to speed on where those opportunities are. Or do not put BME students forward because they say consider them to be out of reach for their students. They, they, they won't make it. They're not the right type. So guidance on these subject choices is really crucial too. And the institutions should do more, as I say. They need to market themselves better. Because as, as Aaron has said, and, and uh, we've heard again as they go, You've heard this before. It's still the, it's the case that London Metropolitan University accepts more black students than all the other um, universities of the Russell Group put together. So top universities should be creating sort of bespoke websites, bespoke promotion materials for, 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 for prospective black students. So these should include testimonies from their black students, mm -hmm. details of support systems, extracurricular activities for BME students. Because we know, and because we know economics come into this, details of how to obtain the bursaries and the scholarship so that they can get the access to that. Because as Heidi said earlier, we're talking about black teachers, you know, they need to show that they're welcoming and encouraging to BME students. It needs to go further than having a black face in the prospectus. Because as I was for five years at my university, even after I left, I was still there. <laughs> and that was five years. My brother, my older brother, he was in it for six years uh, you know, uh, after he was, and he was only there for three. So you know, they have to be the change that we want to see. So it has to be us raising the bar above pretty good, because the government, this government is not interested. It's the government that's reduced the Equality and Human Rights Commission to an irrelevance. It's getting rid of employers' obligations to complete equality impact assessments. It's a government that, as we know, wants to remove Mary Seacole from the national curriculum. Curriculum. The government, this national curriculum has been criticised by the eminent historian Simon Sharma as insulting and offensive. Now, Professor Sharma, as a white man himself, says that proposals for teaching history are too focused on the achievements of white men. He says history is not about self-congratulation. History is meant to keep the powerful awake at night and keep them honest. So I'm into that, but apparently without Mary Seacole. But then what did she ever do for this country? <laughs> See, we hear a lot of these days about how free schools are liberating parents to create schools where there is most demand for the curriculum responsive to the needs of their communities. 
But this liberation strangely seems to apply overwhelmingly where there are predominantly white, middle-class, so-called pushy parents in areas where there's no shortage of school places. So of the, of the 102 approved free schools, and, and Rosemary may have contradicted me on this one, uh, as far as I know, we still await the first government approval of a school intended and to dedicated to cater for predominantly African-Caribbean children. So funny, that isn't it? Because similarly, we're seeing the forced, acad acad forced academization uh, of many schools under an overbearing Ofsted framework. And as a governor of two schools, one primary and secondary, that for different reasons become academies, I'm not against them per se, but, and I've seen for myself how they can improve underperforming schools, but we do need to be vigilant because it's still the case that academies disproportionately exclude more children than any other schools, and we know which children are most likely to be excluded. See, this is critically, critically important because the best explanation I can find why this matters comes from an address my father once gave to a seminar of head teachers. So, sorry, but they say, they say it takes a village to raise a, child, uh, to raise a child, but in my case it takes a family to write me a speech, so for that I, I apologize. But quoting from the Institute of Race Relations report, he told them, exclusion is seldom the measure of a child's capacity to learn. It is an indication instead of the teacher's refusal to be challenged. And when you have an education system which puts a premium not on the educability of the child, but on the price of its education, the challenge to the teacher is the financial cost of keeping it in school, not the human cost of keeping it out. So when, in addition, educability itself is prejudiced in terms of societal stereotype, which associates black with problem, the exclusion of the black child becomes that much more automatic. Conversely, it is precisely because black children are already excluded more than others from most aspects of social life. They need to be included more than others in the educational life of the school, not excluded. So what am I saying? I'm saying that it's an absolutely imperative that we as parents, carers, aunties and uncles are as involved as we can be in our young people's education, because that's their best chance to make it to the top and into the very best educational institutions. So that might mean becoming a school governor and seeing at first hand what goes on in schools and being involved in decisions about exclusions or about how money is spent to raise achievement, as David said earlier. Because you are there to verify that what is being done is right, and if not, to make it so. It may mean being on the Parent Teacher Association, and it definitely means taking every available opportunity to engage with colleges and schools to show your active interest in what they are doing and how your child will benefit. And it certainly means equipping ourselves with as much knowledge as we can about the options facing our young people. Because the point I'm really making is that we have a responsibility to get involved. Because when we do, the whole nature of the discourse changes. And that's just because we're in the room. And that's when institutions change. And that's the best way of giving our young people the best possible platform to make it. Um, and more than that, there is nobody else to do it for us. See, this matters more than ever because we live in a world where a young man living in Spain, an essentially bankrupt country, bailed out by the EU and with rampant youth and unemployment, a man aged 16 to 24 in Spain is still less likely to be unemployed than a black man in the UK. See, that one statistic to me highlights how big the challenge is and how heavy the burden is that we all must share. Because that's the competition. It's not just here, it's Europe. And soon it's going to be China, it's going to be India, it's going to be Brazil, it's going to be Russia. And so, I'll learn to close now. <laughs> But um, before I do, I'd just like to end by paying tribute to Diane for still doing this uh, now for over 10 years. And Diane, as somebody once said, I have to salute your courage, your strength, your indefatigability, <laughs> and to thank you for inviting me to be a part of it. And it's fantastic. Thank you. As you know, I've got noble reasons, but unfortunately it's just not Legend and Beyonce and Timberland. But, um, <laughs> and I, I don't think they're going to wait for me. But um, I just want to say is, for those of you who did come to the 2007 conference, I'm really sorry for the cold patches. It was, the first time fatherhood was to blame. Thank you very much.